What's up everyone, my name's Tom, and today, thanks to the guys over at Gigabyte, we're taking a look at the Aorus RTX 2080 Extreme Edition. First of all though, as always, let's roll on that intro. So, as I said, I've got to say a massive thank you to the guys over at Gigabyte UK. They actually sent me over the RTX 2080 Extreme Edition, this monstrous Kurt Big thing for a review. It is unfortunately only a loner. Hey, can't get everything. But yeah, the RTX 2080 Extreme. Let's uh, take a look at it then. So, like I said, this is only a loner, so I wasn't able to pull it apart. But anyway, we'll start off with the box. And what's in the box? There's not a lot massively notice notable in the box. It is quite a large box. I have actually taken the insert out of it. But one thing that I did find inside the box was this little thing. So we'll start off with the added extras. This is a GPU support bracket. Um, machined aluminium, it is made out of a few different pieces. So you can make it longer, shorter, and slide it up and down. It's got little rubber feet on the top and bottom to support your GPU and to help it stick to power supply shroud or bottom of your case. All in all, actually, quite a nice, just, just a nice little extra when you've spent uh, £800 on an RTX 2080. So, the graphics card itself. It, so, this Behemoth actually comes in at 290 millimeters long. Yeah, it is quite a long card, especially for a 2080. So, a full custom PCB, it's two and a half slot watts wide. So, in other words, budget for a three slot wide case you are not going to be putting these in too close together, you don't want to be. It's got a nice bit of heft to it, it's got three fans on it, Three they're actually 100mm fans, we'll come back to them a little bit later. It's got a nice back plate with some RGB lighting, and on the top, this Aorus logo here and the little fan stop, they also all light up. We do of course have MVLink being a 2080, standard PCI slot on the bottom, and on the back, as you can see, the actual cover is only two slots, but you can see it quite clearly is considerably wider. They say it's two and a half, but really it's a, th it's a three slot card. So while we're taking a look at the outside quickly, we'll take a quick look at the rear IO. It does actually come equipped with three HDMIs, three display ports and a USB-C. But, but wait, you cannot use all seven at a time. The maximum you can use is five at a time. You can either use two HDMIs plus one HDMI, one display port, and one USB-C. So you can use those five, these three that would be black, there is a cover missing, plus these two. Or you can use these two display ports as well as this display port, this HDMI, and this USB-C. What it is, on the back here, there's a little symbol around these four ports, but effectively these two ports are linked together. You can either use this row or this row. You cannot use them both at the same time. But either way, you can connect up to five monitors to this thing. So yeah, plenty of space for lots of added extras. On the front, I did say we have 300 mil bearing fans. The outer two rotate in the same direction, while the inner one actually counter rotates in the opposite direction. And you will notice the inner one actually looks smaller. It is still a 100mm fan, but what they've done is they've taken notches out of the fan blades to allow the outer two to actually pass over the top of it. Uh, there is actually RGB lighting inside the fan blades as well and the Aorus logo. I am going to bring up a bit of B-roll that does show off all of that a little bit later on. So that's the card itself. It is a bit of a monster. It does require two 8-pin power connections. It will draw a lot of power at the same time. It is a full heat-piped, thin arrayed heatsink. I, as I said, this is a lone unit, so I wasn't really allowed to put it apart. But we do have, uh, it is five heat pipes going this way. And I believe we have the same again. I don't have a great visibility, but we do also have a couple of heat pipes again pulling this way because obviously all of the VRMs which produce a good chunk of the heat are here, core is under this side, 
VRMs, it's a 12 plus two phase VRM system. They have designed this for extreme overclocking in mind, hence the name. But that's about it for the outside. With everything turned off, it's a bit of a mundane looking card. Obviously very big, but yeah, it doesn't look too in your face. What I quite like about it is it, apart from the orange MV link cover and the rear ones on the back, it hasn't got anything permanent that distracts from a theme in a build. So you could quite happily just turn all the lights off and have an all black film theme, or use the RGBs to your uh, preference to come up with a full setup. So as I said, this is an RTX 2080. It does come with eight gigabits of eight gigabits, eight gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. And I will just pull up the clock speeds because this is one of the things where this card does well. This, I, from what I did online, this is pretty much the fastest 1080, uh, 2080 that I could find. Now, the stock clocks for an RTX 2080, a reference card, are 1710 megahertz. This one is 180 megahertz faster than that already at 1890. That puts it in, now if you were to take one of the standard cards, you're unlikely to actually achieve the levels of speed that these get. Most from what I did from researching and, and speaking with other people, 150 to 170 megahertz on a core clock is average. So these being higher than that already is a good chunk. Memory is clocked at 14,140, uh, 14, it's pretty much 14 gigahertz on the memory. And you can actually, as I will explain later on, I did actually manage to speed that up quite a lot. So what else do we have? So this has a grand total of 2,944 CUDA cores, a good chunk more than everything else in the past. But the thing about this isn't CUDA cores. The thing about this is the RT cores. And this is actually fitted with a grand total of 63 of them. What that means, we'll get to a little bit later when I pull up the benchmarks. So we'll, what do I actually think of the card as it stands? Yeah, I like it. So I think the important thing is I'm gonna to have to pick up my little notebook and we're gonna go through the benchmarks. Now, I actually, because of this card being an RTX card and being a lot higher specification than anything else I've reviewed or played with in the past, I scrapped all of my old benchmarking, all of my old testing mem uh, system and basically did something completely fresh. And what we've done, we've gone out from the start to compare this with an Asus Strix OC 1080 Ti. Now, when new, a couple of years ago, it was a similar priced card. Now, my remarks on the benchmarks here aren't strictly aimed at this card. They are pretty much aimed at all RTX 2080s. Now, I'm gonna start off with the real in-game benchmarks. We're gonna start off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We've got some Metro 2033. No, we don't, we have some Metro Exodus. We have some Far Cry, the latest one. We also have some Apex and some Battlefield 1, as well as the synthetic 3D marks coming in at the end. So, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we did 4K, 1440, and 1080. And as you can see, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the RTX 2080 was a good chunk ahead across the board. Odd number there for the 1080p gaming, don't know why it came out lower, ran the test a few times, got the same sort of scores, so bit of an odd one there, but yeah, across the board on the whole, a good chunk faster. Uh, we will, we'll actually skip the Metro Exodus and come back to that one later. So now we're gonna take a quick look at Far Cry. This one wasn't quite so um, in favor of the RTX 2080, if I'm honest. As you can see, the benchmark results, it's pretty even. So a few year old 1080 Ti is keeping up with a brand new RTX 2080 at the same price. Bring up Apex Legends now. This is obviously a bit of a, an in-sport eSports title. It's the in thing, everybody going on about it. And pull up the benchmarks and uh, 4K we did see quite the jump. Uh, obviously the thing with Apex and Battlefield when we bring up the scores for that, there is no benchmark for them. So all I was really allowed, able to do was play a few games, keep some scores, take the averages. So 4K, I did see a consist consistently higher result over the 1080 Ti, but the other scores for 1440 and 1080, same as a 1080 Ti. Okay, then we'll take a quick look at Battlefield 1, and as you can see, meh, on the whole, very similar scores to a 1080 Ti. 
Um, now, if we bring up the Metro Exodus, this is where the things got a little bit interesting. If we were to compare just the standard gameplay, no added extras, the RTX, the DLSS, which we'll get to in a bit, the scores are identical. Now, the thing with the RTX card, the two major things you get over a non-20 series card, effectively, is what is called DLSS and RTX. RTX is ray tracing. DLSS is effectively AI. Um, what happens with DLSS is NVIDIA themselves have basically pre-mapped a game. It's the best way to describe it. They have, they have basically pre-rendered the game and then they give it to you in a pre-rendered state sort of thing. Um, bit of a hard one to describe, but that is effectively what happens. Now, I've got three different, four different benchmarks for Metro Exodus because it has the option of allowing me to chop and change the added extras. And as you can see, uh, if we were to turn on just the RTX, we see a significant drop, nearly half the frame rates. Okay, I mean, it, it puts 4K at unplayable. 26 frames a second isn't good enough to play it. I'm sorry, but it's not. Uh, then if we look at the 1440 and the 1080, yeah, those were playable frame rates. If we then take a look at the DLSS frame rates, these frame rates, it looked just as good. Obviously a little bit, there was some variations, but nothing majorly different. But the DLSS looked just as good as the standard game rate, but with frame rates that were 50% higher. Good to see. We then took a look at turning on the DLSS and the RTX. And this is where the card kind of shows what it can do or what the technology is capable of. What we've been able to do is to turn on real-time ray tracing and maintain good speeds by using NVIDIA's own DLSS. Worked really well. The benchmarks show it. Now, in games that support both of them, that worked out really well. So, quick one at the end. We're just gonna take a quick look at 3D Mark, where we're gonna take a look at Time Spy, and we've got Fire Strike. As you can see, the scores are very similar. But then what I did do, thanks to NVIDIA, they've actually allowed RTX, or no, not RTX, ray tracing to be processed onto 10 series cards. And this enabled 3D Mark to put Port Royal, which is their ray tracing simulator, onto a 1080 Ti. And this is where you can see the major difference between a 20 and the old 10 series. Port Royal on an RTX 2080 on this Extreme Edition scored just over 6,000 points. Put it on a 1080 Ti, and say render me the same thing, which in all the other cases we've seen very similar scores, it only scored 2,000 points. That's a third of the, the score. And that there is effectively where this card shows its strengths. So the RTX 2080, what did I actually think of it? Yeah, this one is good. I had no real complaints about it from Gigabyte's point of view. It's got incredibly high clocks. And speaking of those clocks, I then actually went out and decided, can I overclock it a bit more? Bearing in mind, it's already one of the fastest clock cards out on the market. So I put the power limit, I, I used MSI's afterburner. I put the power limit right the way up. I put the temperature limits, I ignored it all, put the fan to 100%. And we managed to actually get another 70 megahertz on top for the core clocks. Not a massive amount, but when you think how much higher this is than everything else already on the market, that's a big jump in total. We had a, if you think about it this way, you had a total score of 260 megahertz over reference. That's quite the chunk. We then played around with memory and I managed to get another 700 megahertz on top of the 1400 and 140, 14,140 megahertz, sorry, uh, that was already there. So we then added effectively another 1400 to that for a near just under 1.16 uh, gigahertz clock speed on the memory. So yeah, you can overclock with this card, but don't forget the really highly clocked cards are never gonna see the bigger jumps, especially under stock cooling. You're not gonna see the bigger jumps in overclocks because they're factory overclocked. They're already pretty pushed to their limit. Whereas if you would take a standard clock speed one, you've got a bit more headroom, but you won't get as high. It, it's a bit weird to describe, but basically, because this is already starting up here, you, you finish up here. You can take a standard one down here and you might match this one, but yeah, you probably will not get to the upper levels that this card managed. Now, 
a few people, I was going through other reviews of this card, and one thing a few people mentioned, and I kind of have to agree with them to an extent, is that this thing was a little bit noisy. Now it's got 300 mil fans on it, and yeah, set them to 100% and it sounds like a jet turbine. It's not quiet, but what I then decided was, let's turn that off because I only did that for my overclocking benchmarking, was let's actually see what it's like in games. And honestly, it was inaudible compared to the rest of the system. Okay, the fans spin. Fans have to spin. Spinning fans make some noise, but it was not a jet turbine under normal circumstances. Okay, 100% fan load was a little bit annoying, but yeah, that was, we can ignore that because it's not normal. But one thing that did irritate me with this card, weirdly, is the fan stop. Because the way the fan stop works, um, over Easter weekend here, it was actually really hot here in the studio, and the standard fan curve for this, it stops the fans at around about 45 degrees, I think it is, off the top of my head, and the fans stop. You think, awesome. When the fans stop, the RGB lights turn on. Okay, not a problem. My room temperature was just at that point where the fans would come on, the card would cool down, the fans would go off, and on, and off, and on, and with it, so did the RGB lights, and that, that was irritating. So what I actually did, I cheated a little bit, I went into MSI's Afterburner, I created a custom fan profile that basically set minimum fan speed to 10%, and so rather than the fans turning off, they were always on just under sort of like 45, 50 degrees. They were set to a very low level. And that then made it perfect. I actually really liked it. Like I said, I'm going to put out a bit of B-roll on the RGB because I really liked that. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to be going through how to do the RGB on this graphics card because we've done a completely separate video on using Gigabyte's Aura software because Gigabyte's Aura software, Gigabyte's RGB Fusion software because... I think that trying to incorporate that into this video would just take too long. We've already been here for quite a while. Let's see. We've already been here for... Ooh. We've already been here for nearly 20 minutes. So I don't want to baffle you on. But yeah, do, you, do I like this card? Yeah, as an RTX 2080, this is a very good card. It is expensive, it is quite the chunk, you can get cheaper ones, you can get a lot cheaper ones, um, but this particular card, apart from the pricing, which Gigabyte don't have a massive play in, unfortunately Nvidia have the biggest role to play in when it comes to pricing, so rather than slating Gigabyte for their pricing on this card, I do have to take a bit of Giga Nvidia, it's £800, that is not cheap. What then put this really into perspective, is the 800 pound 1080 ti that i've got that is a good two years old matches it so would i buy this or would i buy a 1080 ti i have a 1080 ti i wouldn't upgrade would i buy one of these new over buying a used 1080 ti potentially yeah that could be an option um my biggest problem is the pricing it is a really good card the problem is this particular one is £800. The cheaper ones, uh, I believe I've seen them down as low as about £600. That is almost bearable. You are still looking at the performance of a card that's two years old. But, yeah. Um, it, again, that is Nvidia's fault. We're going to ignore that. Um, I'm here to review this card. Um, I'm here to review this for Gigabyte. I am not here to take a dig at Nvidia too much because like I said, um, this is an Nvidia card underneath, but Gigabyte can only work with what they're given. Um, people slate like the, RT the Gigabyte RTX 2080. I can't slate this card for what it is. This card is really good. It's got lovely styling, it's well built. What I can slate is the chip underneath it because that's got nothing to do with Gigabyte. That is all Nvidia and it is overpriced. It is too expensive. Um, would I recommend somebody bought this particular one? Again, probably not, but they do actually offer similar cards. They actually offer this one in a non-extreme. They offer cheaper versions. That is where I'll be putting my money. £800 for this puts it at that price point where it's very expensive for an RTX 2080, and it puts you at not far off of 2080 Ti money, and you would be better off 
buying a cheap 2080 Ti than this expensive RTX 2080. So I think to sum it up for today, Gigabyte have done a really good job with this card. They've worked with what they can. But at the end of the day, Nvidia's pricing cripples it just a little bit. But on that note, I am going to give it a thumbs up because Gigabyte have gone pretty much sort of all out here. They put everything they can into this card. It shows it's built well. It looks nice. So, yeah, I like it. But it's a bit too pricey. So there we go, guys. That is about it for today. If you've liked this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down, not a problem. Any comments, suggestions, or any requests, leave them in the comment section down below. I always take the time to go through them, answer questions, things like that. And if you want to see more of me and the RTX, RTX RGB Fusion review that we're going to be doing probably next week, don't forget, click the subscription button, click the little notification bell, and I'll see you all again this time next week. Bye for now.